Hi, everybody. Welcome to the next episode of the SEMrush webinar series, Show Me the Links. I am your host, Julie Joyce with Linkfish Media, and this is our 13th episode that I've done. So very happy about that. Um, we've got great guests today, as always. We have Carrie Rose from Rise at 7 and Mark Linquist from Mailshake. So our topic today is building and leveraging relationships to consistently earn high quality links from great content because these guys tend to work with you know really good stuff. So they have a lot of great things to say. And we'll start out with defining you know what we mean by good links and good content. But first of all, I wanted to turn it over to Carrie for an introduction. So if you could just tell us who you are, what you do, where you are. Yeah, sure. So hi, I'm Carrie. Um, I'm here in Sheffield in the UK and I currently work um, in digital PR and content marketing for my own agency. So I launched Rise at Seven around five weeks ago. Um, but before that, I've worked within agency sides such as Branded3 and Edit. I worked there for five years, um, building links for clients, coming up with content campaigns, ideas, etc. Um, so yeah. That's cool. How's the new agency going? It's going amazingly well. Like I feel so lucky. Um, obviously, it's very daunting because at my age, I never expected to kind of do this. It came out of nowhere. Um, but yeah, it's going amazing. I, I, I couldn't ask for any better. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> so, Mark, would you do an introduction for us, please? Yeah, sure. So I'm Mark. I am the uh, marketing strategist at Mailshake. Um, and Mailshake is a tool that helps you send uh, cold emails. So basically, uh, if you're doing link building and you're trying to connect with people um, and you want to connect with a couple hundred people at a time, you would use Mailshake to personalize those emails in bulk and then schedule follow-ups. So send the first one and then if they don't reply um, or they click a certain link in the email, you can trigger a follow-up email to send and then another follow-up. And then you can also trigger LinkedIn messages um, and things like that. So a lot of salespeople use it, but we have a lot of link builders and marketers as well. Um, and then I do all the content marketing strategy and link building here at Mailshake. Um, and before this, I was at a couple different marketing agencies doing content marketing. Um, so particularly with building links and creating content in a lot of different industries, uh, I've been doing that for a while. Okay, cool, sounds good. Um, do you guys have a free trial? I don't know if uh, <laughs> yeah, so we, we offer, it's it's a 30 day money back. So if you give us a shot and okay. um, we're, we're not a fit, you can message our support and, uh, um, and get a full refund, uh, no questions asked. But yeah, no free trial, but the 30 day refund. Okay, that's cool. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I wanted to just want to go ahead and dive into you guys just talking about what a high quality link is. So, Carrie, do you want to start with that? Just what to you is a high quality link? Sure. Um, I guess for me, the way that I kind of like see it nowadays, especially, I guess my uh, opinion or view on it has changed over the years. Um, but now I guess it's anything that my clients would recognize. So if I say, do you recognize this website? Have you heard of this website? Or is this something that you would dream to get on? That's what I call high quality. Um, I guess when obviously looking into like whether I should be targeting, targeting that publication, it's anything from engagement rates, um, Twitter following, etc. I don't necessarily Solely use the typical search metrics anymore and um, that is something that I did use a couple of years back and um, I've changed my approach gone for more of like an engagement PR -led approach okay mm -hmm. cool what about you Mark yeah so uh, I look at kind of four different things when it comes to uh, if it's a publication that I want to engage with to get a link um, mm -hmm. the first are uh, domain authority or, or page authority so primarily domain authority so seeing um, using a tool like SEMrush or uh, any of the other tools that you can kind of check with this. Um, usually I shoot for um, above a 50 domain authority. Um, and that sort of uh, narrows down to the, the higher quality sites and at least sites that are active and actively publishing content. Um, the second is relevance. So we are primarily um, a sales and marketing tool, which gives us a lot of uh, different types of sites that we can reach out to that are relevant to the type of content we're creating. Um, and the third is uh, the anchor text. So uh, if I can get, if we're trying to build links, for instance, to a, an article that is about cold email, if we can get uh, the link text to be related to cold email, um, that's generally what we shoot for. And then the last thing, and this is what I would say is most important, is if I'm building, a, if it's, I'm connecting with someone that I can build a relationship with, um, that's sort of my perspective when it comes to link building, is um, if, you know, I, I, it's one thing to get the link on their site, but if they are writing content consistently on other sites or um, have an audience that overlaps with ours, 
the link is just kind of the first step uh, to a, a bigger relationship. So that's really what I try to shoot for um, with any link building effort that I do is finding people that I can connect with, get on the phone with, talk about what our marketing goals are and see where we can align. Um, it goes way beyond uh, just getting the link. Did you say getting on the phone? <laughs> you get on yeah, the yes. phone. So I don't hear that. I don't ever hear that. But I know, I yeah. mean, so many people I know that do it say it's a really successful way to get a good relationship yeah. going in the link. But I'm terrified. Yeah, so, yeah, well, that's the thing is is you exchange some emails. And usually what I do is once once we've started a productive relationship on both ends, you know, I've given them something and they've given me something or whatever. We're having a good conversation. Um, and, and usually it's, you know, our, our audiences appear to overlap. I'll just say that in the email. I'll say, um, hey, it looks like we have a lot of overlap in our audience. I think there might be some opportunities for co-marketing. I'd love to hop on a call and just see what your goals are and how we can work with each other. Um, and my experience has been, it's just, it's harder to have that genuine sort of, uh, you know, it, you only get so much out of email and, and, and writing. You get a lot more out of having conversations with people and getting to know their personality. And I've genuinely made friends. I mean, like I, there's a couple of people where I've traveled to different cities and it's people that I've met through link building outreach that, that I've met up with. And, you know, I would, I would genuinely call them friends. Uh, so I think that's part of the, part of the thing It's it's building a relationship, but not, not like a, not like you're using them. It's right. for me, at least it's genuinely, you know, I get a lot out of it beyond just, just the link or whatever. So yeah, definitely hopping on a call is surprisingly um, effective at, at, connecting with people beyond just what you get over email. I, mean, I can see that. Someone asked, mm -hmm. Olivia Jane was asking in the chat for you, Mark, how can you control the link and anchor text? What do you do to try uh, to get what you want? Yeah, so it, it, it depends on, on what you're doing. So sometimes if you're doing outreach and you're, uh, you're submitting a quote to an article that's already been uh, published, um, that's something that we do because it's, it's not just like, hey, can you put this link in your article? We're, we're adding a little bit of content to something that they published to make it a little better. Uh, then you have control sometimes over, over where the link is in your quote. So whether that's, um, you know, the, the quote is related to cold email and it's, it's building on a concept that they're covering in the article. Uh, in my quotes, I'll, I'll, I'll put the link to the site that, or to the page that I'm trying to build a link to um, mm -hmm. on, on the anchor text that I want to put it on. Um, and, and sometimes they'd rather not have have anchor text like that, uh, and they'll they'll tell you and and you know how they respond. But uh, for the most part, people are okay as long as the quote is genuine and and good content. Um, most people are okay with that. So usually it's it's with quotes. It's adding quotes mm -hmm. to to content. Okay. Good yeah. question. Well, I, I wanted to go back to to Carrie, um, so she could talk about how do you define great content. Sure. Um, I guess for me, I kind of like have four things that I always think about um, when it comes to kind of like great, creating good content. Um, and it's content that's either engaging, resourceful, position you guys as like, oh, your client, sorry, as an expert or as value. So just to kind of like explain that. First of all, there's the engaging content. So it's content that is shareable, that is going to drive traffic to your website and keep them on site for a longer period of time than just a click, quick glance. Um, there's resourceful content. So whether that's um, data-led reports or guides, um, which also position you as experts. Um, so whether that's top tips or like um, places to go, but also kind of like industry reports and things like that. Um, and then content which adds value to say another publication or another journalist. Um, and then a lot of that is usually, um, again, data-led stuff um, or tips um, from the experts within the company. Um, so any sort of content that we can create on site, which naturally would kind of appeal to a journalist or appeal to another publication that's thinking, oh, that's interesting for not only myself or my readers, um, but for users generally just to kind of um, get to know a topic, but also um, kind of like pass away around that um, expert tease in a way. Um, so yeah, so it's all about having that sort of content on your website, which which other, other publications um, could link to. Okay. Mark, yeah. do you do much with, I mean, I know you do a lot of the outreach and all of that. Do you deal with creating content? Are you involved in that? Yeah, so uh, I, I handle all of the, the content strategy. We have a team of writers that, that do the research and write the articles, but um, overseeing the outlines and coming up with topics and everything uh, is, is part of my role. So 
Um, a couple things around great content. I think the first is if it's written by a uh, uh, expert who has personal experience with the topic that they're writing about. Um, for me, that's it's, it's always really clear, particularly with marketing content, when the person writing it has actually done what they're talking about versus just yeah. they're researching and, and you know it, it can only be so good if you haven't don't have personal experience with um, with the topic that you're talking on. Uh, so that would be the first one is if you can get subject matter experts, uh, whether you're interviewing them. That's one thing that we've done at Mailshake is what I'll do is I'll listen to uh, sales podcasts and. Mm -hmm. uh, They've done the hard work for me of finding people that have interesting things to say about interesting topics. Um, and I'll just email them and I'll say, hey, I loved your episode on X podcast on Y topic. We want to cover um, a similar topic on our blog. I'd love to interview you um, and use that as, and I kind of give the interview to our writers to write the article. Um, right. That's been, some of our best content has come from, from that. And that's another actually, uh, 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 the success rate on the outreach is really high. You get on the phone with them, you have a good conversation. Um, they, you, you know, you write a good article, so they see that you can do good work. And then um, there's a lot of opportunities to work, you know, kind of whatever comes of that. Um, and the second uh, thing that I like to think about when I'm trying to come up with topics is um, like what, what top spin can I put on a topic that makes it a little bit different than the way that other people are talking about it? Because there's like a million articles, for instance, on employee engagement. This is an example from one of the agencies I worked at. Um, employee engagement has some search volume, so it was a topic that we wanted to cover. Um, but writing an article on you know top tips for employee engagement, it's it's been kind of done to death. So the the angle we wanted to try to come up with a way of presenting it that was unique and not just kind of the Me Too content that that you see out there. So what we did is. Glassdoor comes out with a top 50 companies to work for, small, medium, and large companies. So we reached out to all of those companies and sent them a survey about how they do, uh, how they build employee engagement um, with their employees. And for them, their communications people got back to us and they were excited to work with us on it. And I think the article turned out a lot better because it was, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's still top tips for employee engagement, but the top spin of, from Glassdoor's top companies to work for, made it a lot more interesting of an article, and a lot easier to build things to. Uh, it was one that ended up ranking uh, for employee engagement. So those are the two ways I try to think about coming up with, with, with good content. Okay. I wanted to mention, uh, just kind of going back to something, someone asked about, when you were talking about asking for a link and with the anchor text, about whether a link exchange was you know, a violation of Google's guidelines, and I just wanted to say, I don't think we're, Unless I'm misunderstood, we're not really talking about a link exchange. We're just talking about right. asking for a link, which is not against their guidelines. I think that yeah. they mean, yeah, when you say, I'll link to you if you link to me, and that's on a huge scale. So, yeah, so yeah. That, that's right. I think if you, uh, you know, a link for a link on each other's sites, I think it's really easy for Google to identify when that happens and then devalue the links. And if you do too much of it, they might, they might penalize manually the site. So I wouldn't recommend doing a direct link trade. Uh, and that's yeah. Just to clarify, that's it's it's a um, you're yeah. You're not you're not offering a link for a link when you're doing that type of outreach. Right, right. Okay. Someone asked, "What do you do when a new site gives you a link but it's no follow?" Carrie, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, absolutely nothing. <laughs> and the reason for that is because um, here in the UK we have a lot of websites which just have a no um, a policy which is like no follow throughout the site. So no matter what your website is, no matter the content, it will always be a no follow. And um, for me, I guess, the way that I um, approach link acquisition and building links is through a PR approach. So creating content that is naturally going to get links and talked about. So if I try to manipulate in that anyway, so um, asking for it to be followed or anchor text or anything like that, that's not something that I personally do. And um, I just try to create content that naturally gets that links that journalists think, oh, I want to link to that because it adds value to my story. So I guess, yeah, for the question around it being no followed, I don't do anything if I'm completely honest. Um, I, I go with it, I go with the flow. I'm not going to kind of like approach a journalist and request that they change it because um, I don't want to come across spammy in any way. I want to keep that relationship with the journalist so that next time that if I have a nice piece of content or whatever it is that hopefully it'll be followed next time or that they would speak to me again, cover my content, etc. cetera. Um, so I try not to kind of like badger them in too much, in two ways like that. Right, that's good. That's a good mm -hmm. answer. 
while I have yeah, you, I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just want to, yeah, I think to build on <laughs> that, uh, for, yeah, I think if you're, if you're doing outreach to, uh, to larger publications, or if you're, if you're trying to get links on larger publications or connect with journalists, I think that that's definitely the approach. Um, you definitely don't want to come off as spammy yeah. or desperate or, uh, kind of, contributing to the noise that these people are hearing all the time, um, especially, again, larger publications, the ones that your clients have heard of that, that you were talking about is one of your definitions of, of a quality uh, link. It's you prioritize the relationship first. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree with Carrie on that for sure. Okay. Sorry, I didn't ask you. <laughs> I'm thinking <laughs> no, 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 here. Yeah. I need to make sure I'm asking you both all this. I just thought no, somebody no. asked a question about a UK outreach to US clients. And I thought Carrie would be perfect to take that. I don't know if you can see the question in the chat, but it's um, have any advice for a UK agency outreaching a digital PR campaign to the US. We've struggled to get it to land over there despite featuring US data. So any tips would be great. And that's open for both of you too, of course. I didn't know either of you has any tips for that for working in the US if you're in the UK? Well, I could say when I worked for an agency that was based in, um, in Australia, mm -hmm. and um, so they were doing outreach, especially when we joined, uh, we were doing outreach together uh, for, um, for Australian clients and doing outreach to companies in the US. And I'm trying to think, I don't think that there was any ever any as long as the content was, was quality. Um, I don't think that uh, our outreach was any different mm -hmm. uh, depending on where the company was based. I know that going from the U.S. to Europe, which I do all the time, um, mm -hmm. there's not I've, I've never there's never been an issue where someone was like, oh well, it's a different country and that changes their their kind of calculation on their interest of working with me. Um, right. So yeah, from, from the US to the UK and to Europe, and then also from Australia back to the US, uh, from my experience, it hasn't really changed our strategy or average at all. Right. Sorry about that. I think my internet just went down and it just completely went. I was like, oh no. <laughs> That's okay. Did, did you want to contribute to that too? Any, anything else for that? Because I didn't know if you heard what Mark said. We were just talking about UK outreaching you know, for a US client. If you had any tips on that. Ah, oh, that's interesting, actually, because um, that's a discussion that a lot of people in our industry has had in the other way around. So um, whether we would outreach internationally via just a UK client. Um, and yeah, I would. Um, so for me, I guess, um, is any sort of content that would reach a large audience and that naturally would pick up links in, say, the US or the Canada, etc. Absolutely. That's something that I would um, intend on doing. I guess the value is still there and um, users are still interested in that sort of topic or the content they want to see what a brand has created um, and it wouldn't necessarily kind of like stop me from outreaching internationally even if it was just a UK based client for an example. Okay mm -hmm. makes sense. Uh, another good question in the chat was is there more value if a client writes something and it's credited to them personally versus the actual agency? Does it matter to um. you? Uh, in my experience, it's um, if if the client a if the client can can actually write content, or mm -hmm. you can even just if they have a lot of subject matter expertise and you can interview them and write content on their behalf, and they can build a brand within uh, the the industry, and um, and you can leverage that. Uh, that's something that we've when we can we try to do. We do it at Mailshake. Uh, the founder of Mailshake, Shuzan Patel has a brand within the marketing space. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, he's, he's built that over a long period of time, creating content, and that's been really valuable for us. So uh, Carrie, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this, but um, I, if, if, a, if a client is interested and capable of contributing or creating great content and yeah. can be the author, that's something that, we, that I've seen work really well. Yeah, absolutely. From my perspective, that's that's something that we push massively from not only expert guides, tips, data, etc. So then providing content from, say, the CEO or the, some of the like 
um, higher up staff like directors, etc. Um, but news jacking as well is a big strategy that we use. So news jacking, just to kind of define that, is say if there is a certain topic in the press um, that is going viral or being talked about a lot, we would then get somebody in client side to provide expert tips or commentary on that and push that to press. So to put that into perspective or what that means is, um, say if there is a story in the press regarding cryptocurrency, we would then go to our client and say, okay, we have an expert in cryptocurrency or this guy that kind of like knows um, uh, or has some data or an opinion on that. Can you, can we gather that and then push it out to press? So it, yeah, I 100% agree with Mark in terms of building them um, as experts because that's where people want to come to. They want to come to people and not a brand. Um, so I find that's the biggest thing that we do is, build um, the personalities within the company rather than the brand itself. Does that make sense? Okay. And mm -hmm. someone asked a question in the chat that was kind of related to that. What about repurposing existing news stories with a twist, which is kind of what you're talking about, you know, just or grabbing something from news. Yeah. They were asking, do you think that's a good strategy to start out with? Oh, absolutely. I actually recall about the number one strategy. And the reason for that is, um, the best performing content from a links perspective or from a results perspective has been content that's been relevant now. So say if that's something in the news that's going on. Um, I don't know whether Love Island is quite big internationally, but it's a, a big topic in the UK. I've heard all about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely, if you get a chance to watch it, it's, it's a fun watch. <laughs> um, but take that as an example. It's one of, been one of the biggest topics within TV for the last four weeks. Um, and what we did as an agency is pulled some data together to talk about how much these people on Love Island um, would potentially earn by being, um, for being now an influencer on Instagram, et cetera. So we reacted to kind of a topic that was in the press. It was going viral. It was something that everybody was talking about and put another angle or another spin on it. So yeah, definitely. I, that's um, a great kind of way of monitoring press, monitoring topics through Google Trends, um, looking at Twitter every morning, seeing what everyone's talking about and reacting with expertise or data or something. Okay, I wanted to go back to some of the submitted questions before I forget sure. to do that um, <laughs> because uh, I just had one one from Mark about Mailshake that someone had asked, how do you keep Mailshake compliant to the rules of CASL, the Canadian Spam Law? Yeah, so uh, whether it's like GDPR or CAN Spam or CASL or any of the um, any of those spam laws, um, Mailshake as a product is is compliant with all of them in the sense that uh, and, and the way that we hold your data and the way that um, we allow you to completely delete and erase data from the platform and everything. Um, so the Mailshake platform is, is compliant. The question more so is, is in the way that you use the platform. So basically Mailshake connects into your email and allows you to send personalized emails in bulk. Um, and that can or can't or could not be GDPR or CASL compliant depending on how you do it. Uh, so there's a couple different ways of of staying compliant with that, um, including a way for people to unsubscribe, whether that's a link or you just put a PS. If you don't want to hear from me, just reply with remove me or whatever, and then Mailshake will take them off the list immediately. Um, but having a, having a clear way for people to unsubscribe is one really uh, essential way to stay compliant with that. Um, and I don't want to give any legal advice with this. We have an article that is based off of uh, what real lawyers have talked about of staying compliant with, with GDPR, which my understanding is the strictest of all of the uh, mm -hmm. spam uh, compliance rules. Uh, so I can, I can share that maybe in the chat uh, or we can, we can share it after. Uh, but um, yeah, the mail shake is compliant. It's, it's the way you use it that can make you compliant or not basically. Okay. And another question we had um, was from Alice who had submitted this question about state.gov links. And I don't know if either of you do that much with it. I don't tend to do much with government link building, you know, trying to get gov links. But if, if either of you have anything to say on that, I'd be happy to hear it. I was just, I guess in general, when people ask about that, I'm kind of curious as to if it, you know, if they actually are going to be relevant links or, you know, we're told kind of like the gold standard, people still want to mm -hmm. get gov links and edu links. So do you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, for me, I guess it's not part of my main strategy, um, but if I can get an education link or anything like that, then that's an absolute bonus. And the best ways to do that I've found is um, reports. 
Um, so whether that's positioning data around a certain topic, um, there was one, for an example, a campaign that I did, this was about three years ago, and what we actually did was um, conducted a bit of an analysis of bacteria in the London underground, so it's a bit of like a science e <laughs> experiment, um, but that um, not only got links from the Daily Mail, the BBC and things like that, but um, some of the universities linked to the research um, as like a report, um, because we did work with students on like the um, experiment, ga gathering the bacteria samples, etc. Um, yeah. And also like recently, um, I got a link um, to my own website, um, Rise at Seven, um, purely from an interview perspective, so they kind of saw me as a success story, so then they interviewed me of like what's happened to me since graduating university for an example and um how I kind of went on to like run my own business and um, so if you have like nice like um business stories and stuff to pitch to older um universities that you went to um so that's like a good way for like university links um, and government links especially um is from data-led reports anything kind of like local and um, whether that's like looking into safety crime stuff like that and um, that's where a lot of gov links come from mm -hmm. okay good yeah answer. and i have a friend that actually so i don't do the dot gov or dot edu link building um uh just because I, I i tend to try to find people that are in the the marketing or sales spaces and then build off of that. Uh, but I know someone who uh, basically did an ego bait play for .edu links. So mm -hmm. he he runs a uh, basically Uber for lawn care is the way he describes it. And um, they wrote a bunch of articles like the top 10 uh, uh, like lawn and gardens or whatever in, in like the top 10 colleges with the best lawns in the Midwest and in mm. the East Coast and in the South and whatever. And they got a ton of links from all of these schools because they just ranked them in the top 10 and then emailed them and like, hey, we just, you know, this lawn care company just ranked you as like the, the best lawn in Georgia or something. Yeah. And uh, they got like 30 links, 30.edu links just from writing these, these listicles. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess ego bait works pretty well for the .edu links. Yeah. Um, and .gov, I know that people, the, the, the one that I've seen is is resource page link building. A lot of mm. .gov or .edu sites have have pages dedicated linking out to resources. I'd imagine that they get pitched a lot. Um, so it might be tough, especially now that it's, it's become, I think maybe like five years ago when it was first picking up, yeah. um, it, it might have been easier. Uh, another one that people used to do that I don't imagine works as well anymore is um, sponsoring um uh what's it called uh scholarships so you do like a thousand dollar scholarship for you know someone go like my buddy actually did this also within the lawn and garden space so people going into some outdoor related major he sponsored a scholarship at universities and then they put a link to his scholarship page on their on their their resource page um so that's another one that's pretty common. I, I think that that's, that was another one that was really good five years ago. I'm not sure how good it is now. Okay. I want to go back to some of the questions that we had on the list for a second and then kind of jump back in because Lily had submitted a question asking, can you still get penalized by having poor quality backlinks? Because supposedly the new Google algorithm update should not take bad links into account. So what do you guys think about that? Yeah, someone asked me the same question recently, um, and it was actually a competitor in their industry was caught kind of like doing a lot of like spammy link building stuff. And they felt like annoyed that they wouldn't get penalized for it. Um, and I, the way that I kind of explained it is, but what they're doing is spending a lot of money on, say, doing this sort of stuff. And although they might not be getting penalized, they're not seeing any growth. And um, so for the next 12 months, you might actually see that um, nothing happens and they're spending so much money and you're seeing growth um, because you're doing everything right. Um, so yeah, I guess um, the way that Google's kind of changed is it's constantly looking at the backlink profile and rating you based on quality now and relevance, etc. cetera. Um, so rather than kind of like penalizing for bad, um, bad and unethical stuff, um, it's more just kind of ignoring it and I don't know, it's wasting your budget in a sense. Right, what do you think, Mark? Yeah, yeah I think if, if you're doing uh, spammy outreach and getting links on spammy sites, eventually Google, you know, the algorithms will keep getting better because that's, it's clearly what they don't want you to do is to be able to do, you know, that there used to be PBNs back in the day 
where you could people would buy a bunch of domains and sell the links and Google picked up on that and and you know I, I think most people can recognize if the site is is spammy or the type of outreach they're doing feels spammy and if eventually sooner or later Google will recognize that and either penalize you or devalue the links um, so it's just whether even if it works right now some some tactic works well right now uh, but it's it's like it's clearly kind of spammy it's just it's not a long-term business strategy even if it's effective in in the short term so I would just stay away from that because there's there's no there's no long-term value there yeah and I kind of agree with Carrie I, I mean I used to think bad links would hurt you and I'm kind of of the opinion now that from what I've seen I think they're probably mostly ignored mm -hmm. I'm not saying go get them because that is a complete waste of money but you know, yeah. I don't. I haven't. I haven't seen anybody getting any big penalties lately. So I may be in the minority there. All right. Another question. Going back to the beginning, how do you identify the right people to connect with when you guys are reaching out? Mark, do you want to start that one? Yeah. So uh, first, I look for publications uh, in the space. That's that's the 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 first thing that I look for is relevant publications and then um, I look on the site to see if there's one person that publishes most of the content um, and then that's generally the person that I would reach out to uh, and then I go on LinkedIn um, if there's not someone clear from from the site and try to find someone with content or marketing or something like that in their in their title uh, and if I can't find that if it's a really small company I'll reach out to the founder or the CEO um, because generally the um, you know, even even if I can't find a marketer, and and even if they have one, if I reach out to the CEO and they send it down to their marketer, I'll always get a response from from the marketing person. So if worst comes to worst, I shoot high. Uh, um, most, I mean, at smaller companies, so not like the the CEO of Salesforce or something. But if it's a clearly a relatively small company, you can usually connect with the CEO. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, editors or writers at um, or content marketing strategists or managers at um, at relevant blogs. Is, is where I start. And then um, in terms of trying to build a relationship with the right people, uh, I try to find people that are doing a lot of guest posting. It's people who are writing on a lot of different domains that are in the space, um, generally are the most active and uh, the most interested in some kind of co-marketing. Uh, so that would be, those would be the two or the three, I suppose, uh, things that I look for for, uh, for connecting with people. Okay. What about you, Carrie? Yeah, similar approach, um, but that little bit different in a sense of, um, for me, kind of, I mainly only ever target um, your top tier publications and news, news sites, etc. So I'm mostly connecting with journalists, editors, writers, and to kind of like target, obviously, the most relevant ones and the right ones, um, I usually start just by Googling the topic. So if, for an example, I have a story on Disney, I would just Google Disney, let's look at what journalists are already talking about Disney as a topic um, within the last, say, three months. And then I would use a database called Golkana or there's others like Vrello, um, what other ones are there? Um, there's a couple of others out there, just a journalist database. Um, and then I would get their contact um, and then like pitch my story in. Um, so that way that you're not hammering anybody that's within the entertainment space, for an example, if it's Disney related, well, you're literally targeting the right people that talk about Disney every single day, maybe. Um, and in terms of them building the relationship, so I usually do interact with them on Twitter and stuff like that. So journalists um, over here, like they have not a lot of time nowadays to kind of build relationships with PRs like myself. Um, so they, I actually um, spoke to a, a journalist at a top tier media publication recently and she said every day she has to write around eight articles a day and she has an hour to write every article. So mm -hmm. yeah, her time is very much limited. So um, in terms of building the relationships, she would much rather me um, tweet her or like, I don't know, connect with her on social media in some way because it's easy um, rather than kind of bombarding her and stuff. Um, because I've tried every single approach from emails to calling um, social media and um, I just try to be most convenient for them if that makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So when and you I, got, oh, go, ahead, go uh, ahead. Sorry, I, I, I had something, just one more thing to say on, on, I think I can get a little more specific on finding uh, the right, if the, if the right people come from the right uh, domains or the right blogs, for me, uh, the way I find the right blogs is I'll take 
a competitor of ours, a content competitor. Um, so for instance, close.com is another sales tool in our space that writes a ton of really good sales content. And I'll punch them into SEMrush and mm -hmm. see all the sites that are linking back to them. Yeah. Uh, Cause presumably a lot of them will be relevant and writing sales content. And then um, there is a manual element to this where you just pop in, follow the link, see if they're publishing, publishing frequently or recently. Um, and if they actually are relevant to sales or marketing, or if it was just kind of a one-off link. Um, but that, that is a pretty deep well of potential mm -hmm. people to connect with, the potential blogs to connect with, because you can do that over and over and over again. I think it depends mm -hmm. on the space you're in where sales and marketing, there's, there's a lot more to work with. Um, but then on the other hand, if it's a, if it's a smaller content community, um, you can probably find uh, the most, the, the people that you want to build the relationships with most, you're going to be able to find by doing that, checking the backlinks of your content competitors. So yeah. that, that'd be one place I would start at for that. Mm -hmm. Right. So how do you keep your emails from going into the spam folders or getting deleted? I mean, how do you actually get these emails through to people when you're trying to reach them? Do you have any tips on yes. that? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. So uh, the first is, um, is if, you, if you have a new domain or you haven't been sending a lot of emails, um, Google and other, other spam checkers are really skeptical of the domain that you're sending from. So you can't start with a new email address and send a thousand emails a day because uh, you'll immediately get picked up and marked as spam. And um, once, once you get a bad sender reputation, you might as well toss the domain. It's really hard to overcome that. And then you can't just make a new email and start from scratch because you've know, been, been flagged. Um, so the first thing that I would do is, if you haven't been doing a lot of outreach, is to start small and um, you know a couple emails a day and build up from that. Uh, so that would be the first one. And then uh, the second is uh, not doing huge send outs. So I never really do more than 60 to 80 emails in a, in a single campaign. Um, and it's usually, it's usually less than that. So like some people will do really spray and pray kind of uh, hundreds or thousands of emails all at once. Mm -hmm. um, and all it takes is a few people to start marking you with spam or for your open rate to be really bad uh, for, for you to start building that bad reputation. So it's just like, I think it's not effective, first of all. I mean, so eventually the math will work out where if you reach out to a million people and you get a 0.001% success rate, you know, the, you'll, that, that'll be a good number of links, but it's, it's just more effective in the long term to do smaller batches of outreach that you can personalize more effectively. And then um, if, if your open rates and, and reply rates are, are good on those smaller batches of outreach, um, you shouldn't have an issue. I do, we do a ton of outreach at Mailshake. We have a couple different people doing like building outreach. Um, and it's all in those relatively small batches and we've never had an issue with uh, with reaching people's reaching people's inboxes and avoiding the promotions tab. Okay. Yeah, and, I, and from my side, um, so I've never really had any issues from kind of like um, the junk side either, getting into junk folders, but um, one person did tell me that if you include way too many links within your email, for an example, so like linking off to different parts of your website, or if you're attaching, say, a video into the email, a lot of the time that can shoot it to the junk folder. So that's something that I try to kind of refrain from doing. So if I really want to send a video piece, for an example, I would just do a screenshot image of it and then link to the video through a, either a Dropbox or a YouTube or wherever the video is hosted, etc. Um, so yes, yeah, so I know that other people have had issues and then solved it through those ways. Oh, that's yeah. A good yeah, attaching for sure. That's a good point, Carrie. Definitely don't send attachments in, mm. in cold outreach. Uh, those will often get picked up as spam. Um, and then there's also, uh, and, then, and then also links. So that's a really good point as well. Uh, if you're tracking opens on your emails, that's actually a link. That's how that tracking system works. So uh, keep that in mind as that if you're tracking opens, that counts as having a link. Um, so we actually have a free tool. You don't have to sign up for Mailshake or anything that uh, checks all these things. So checks for 
the length of your email, if you're using any trigger words. So like if you use free and lots of exclamation points and we have like 60 trigger words that, um, that can trigger spam, getting caught in spam or promotions, um, the number of links, all that kind of stuff. I can, I can share that after the, um, after the webinar here. Uh, it's it's okay. mailshake.com slash email dash analyzer and uh, totally free, uh, nothing to sign up for, no email to submit. And it, it, you type in your, your message or your email and it in real time says like, don't use the word free in your subject line. It can come off as spammy and there are too many links. Consider taking one of them out, uh, stuff like that. But I think if you're, if you're speaking like a real person and you're not sounding super spammy and you're avoiding the, the, the big no-nos like attaching and too many links, I think you'll mostly be fine. Okay, I think uh, Sam Russ have just put that into the chat for the link for that. So thank you for that. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. What do you guys, what do you think about making each outreach email personalized? Do you try to do that? I don't know how many emails, you know, you send out, if you're sending out a hundred at a time, I don't know how you make that completely personalized, but what are your thoughts on that? Can yeah, I guess, I guess, um, a lot of people think our oh, personalization usually means looking into what they have previously written and then mentioning that in email and saying, oh, you spoke about this, so let's talk about it again. However, um, I guess for me, for personalization, is just making sure you know what they already write about as topics and saying, hi, I think you might like this because I know you already talk about it. Um, you don't need to go into too much detail. Um, so obviously going into every single email outreach would take a lot of time to personalize, um, but making sure it's relevant. So relevance is the, the, big, the biggest thing for me. Um, so like, oh, I know that they have spoke about this topic or passionate about it in some way. Um, so I'm going to kind of reach out to them. Um, yeah, so I guess if yeah. you do your research, you know, before you actually yeah. passed out a ton of emails. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree with Carrie. I don't, I think uh, um, having a good idea about like the general topic they tend to go. It's, I, it's the exact same for me. So when I'm doing research for choosing the publications I'm going to reach out to, um, I'll put in like a phrase that's like, uh, just that it's like the general topics that they cover. So like if they write, have a lot of articles about sales prospecting outreach, for instance, I'll put that in a column in my spreadsheet. And then with Mailshake, you can, you can add those as text replacements. So I'll say something like, I'll have a template that's like, hi, first name, uh, love what you're doing on name of blog, blog. Um, and uh, we cover a lot of the same topics specifically around, and then that little phrase that we cover the same topics for. Um, so just finding that that common ground um, and making it clear that that you've actually looked at their blog and it's not just a totally, again, spray and pray type of outreach. Uh, but yeah, just making sure that you're, you're Referencing the type of content that they create, um, I think, is a good place to start. I think it's 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 important to personalize to some degree, um, but if you can get a template and then kind of um, eighty twenty it from there, uh, it, at some point it doesn't move the needle that much. If you're going to write a hundred percent personalized every single email, it's like maybe that'll get you, you know, an extra ten percent. But uh, the amount of time that's going to take to do that. Uh, Starting with a template and personalizing off of that is is makes more business sense. All right. Okay. Well, I was going to switch topics because we had a few people ask about reporting. Um, I know we had talked about no follow links earlier, where Carrie was saying that was totally fine. We do have a question. So, if you're reporting your links to your client, you know, talking about this, do you report links on syndicated networks? And I know recently I've been reading some people say, you know, if you if you have a piece of content and it gets syndicated across 100 sites, they would count that as 100 links. Some people say they would only count that as one link. Well, what do you guys think about that? Or, or it could be on a scrape site, too. So if scraper picked up your content. Would you count that as a link? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And um, so for me, I do report on it as a link, but I will always kind of label it as what it is. So I'll be very kind of like honest and communicating what that is. Um, but there are a lot of sites, for an example, um, especially across different regions within the UK, if, if the same amount, same content goes across every single region. Um, when looking into actually the um, the traffic that that's driving, um, a lot of people kind of come through those tra uh, come through those links in different ways. So um, my my client would be certainly interested in in that. 
Um, so Manchester Evening News is a very kind of like regional publication in Manchester, and um, a link um, on Manchester Evening News could drive, say, a thousand people. So I make sure that I report on it, um, not only from a links perspective, but traffic as well. And I just highlight this is a syndicate link, this is um, canonical work in any way. So make sure I'm honest and open. Right. Mm -hmm. Mark, you have anything to add on that one? Uh, yeah, I mean, if I were reporting to clients, that's how I would do it. I right. would, I would say that you know this got syndicated because we used to get get links on like Forbes or Entrepreneur, and those get syndicated pretty widely. Right. Um, I don't really count it as having a, a big um, SEO value, but for referral traffic, I think that that yeah. makes sense. And I would definitely say that it happened, but um, make that note. There are some sites out there, for an example, that do pick up a lot of Forbes articles from there. And when you're looking to kind of the site, there's just no quality behind them. There's no following and stuff. I wouldn't report on that. I would look at how authentic yeah. the website is. And um, so, you know, there's a lot of kind of like um, sites that you you look at and you can clearly see from just the ads that are placed on the right hand side, like this is not an, you know, an authoritative site or authentic in any way. There's, there's not actually people behind this website, it's usually just bots. And that's not something that I would report on. Okay. Yeah, I agree. But you do report on no follow links. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, yeah. what about you? Uh, internally, we don't. Um, usually, if, if, I, if I get a no follow link, uh, this is where the value of a relationship comes in. We recently had a link for a guest post that we wrote that was no followed, but I knew the editor fairly well and they went in and changed the link to, to a follow link. Um, okay. If it's a no follow, if it's a no follow link um, and it's one that I was like actively trying to build, I'll usually try to get that changed if I know the editor. Otherwise, uh, internally, I wouldn't report it. Externally, I would, again, being in a different situation. If I had a client and they got a link or I got a link and then it was no follow. I think there's still value in that yeah. link from, from different directions, but from an SEO side and internally, we don't, we don't have the no follow links in reporting. Okay. So how would you ask, oh, were you going to, I'm going. Oh, <laughs> I was just going to go back to the kind of like um, engagement side as well for that one. So um, the Daily Mail in the UK, they have a strict policy of no following every external link. Um, however, and um, I landed my client in the Daily Mail um, last year sometime. And it was actually a couple of years ago. And that link actually drove over 100,000 people to the website. Absolutely crazy. Like, and it, yeah. it, it broke my client's website. They was pretty annoyed. <laughs> but obviously yeah. happy that we drove so much traffic. Um, mm -hmm. And then we could then target them and kind of like get them to kind of move around the site um, through different content, et cetera. Um, but that's kind of why we can still do um, report on no follows. Um, and syndicate links, et cetera. We try to be honest about everything that we land um, through our content. Right. Yeah. Well, that's a good point about them sending a lot of traffic. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So how do you ask for a link if a publication just mentions your content or your study or data, but they don't link to you? Do you go back and ask for a link? Yeah, mostly I well all the time. Um, if I know that they're not going to give a link um, because I know their policy, then obviously I won't um, badger them in any way. But um, in terms of trying to get that link, um, it's mainly from a um, we have this valuable um, report or asset on our website that I think would add value to your um, article. If it's just a link to say my client's homepage or a product page or a service page, that's not necessarily something that I would ask for because it's not natural. Whereas if it was an article talking about say crime in the UK and I had a report on crime in the UK going up over the past 10 years, then I'd say, hey, I think this might add value to your story. Would you link to the um, credit as a resource? Um, so yeah, definitely from um, the way that I word it is usually like, would you credit where you've got our story or your story or data from um, and try add value as much as possible. Mark, what about yeah. you? Yeah, I would do the same. If, if somebody mentions uh, content of ours or like references a stat that we have on a, on a page, uh, I'll ask for a link. I think you can do it in a way that's like appreciative of them mentioning you and recognizing uh, something you created. And like people know, like you, if you're reaching out to get a link, I think it's not like, um, I, I think people, people aren't gonna be surprised you know, I, I, it doesn't have to feel like like spammy or whatever. It just be thanks so much for for referencing our content, whatever. Uh, we would really appreciate it if you could add a link. And generally, people will, um, especially if they're especially if they're referencing 
specific mm-hmm. content you've created, they should have a link for that anyways. Um, right. If, and we do, so we track our branded mentions. So if someone mentions Mailshake and doesn't link to us, uh, we actually will reach out and um, you know appreciate you mentioning Mailshake. Would you mind linking to, to Mailshake? Um, and again, people generally will for that. Right. And then it, that's also something is if they're writing about, if they're writing about you, they are probably writing about similar topics that, that you cover. And then there's an opportunity there again to, yeah. to build a relationship and, and um, see what else you guys can, can connect on. Right. Okay. Um, there's a question about content ideation. I was going to start with Carrie on this. What are your top tips for content ideation? And can you tell us exactly what that means? Yeah, sure. So um, I actually think when kind of like trying to land links back to your client's websites, the hardest thing is coming up with a good idea, um, how to create a good story. Um, And the biggest thing um, or the first thing that I do, um, something that Mark actually mentioned um, previously was looking into competitors. So using tools such as SEMrush and looking at um, as well as Buzzsumo as well. So SEMrush, I can look into the backlink profile of my competitors and look at where they're getting links from, but also what was the story that was linking to those so that way I can kind of come up with ideas and stories that I can create for my clients to get similar links but not only that I do use Buzzsumo quite a lot and um, so Buzzsumo I can type in the um, topic or the um, uh, URL of say my client's website or my competitor's website and look into the most shared articles what sort of content is being talked about quite a lot and that way I can get inspiration um, for um, what sort of content I should be creating but a lot of the time as well um, I actually do use a lot of like word association. So if I know that I need to come up with a hol- um, a campaign around holidays, I would then use holidays as my term and then branch off from that. A bit like a spider diagram web where I literally think about, okay, holidays to beaches, to flights, to prices, to children. Mm. I, I'll, I'll create all these div- different words that I can come up with ideas around and think, right, what stories and content are my audience going to be interested in surrounding that topic? Okay. I think that's a useful thing to do. We do that with my team. Just, you know, they're not creating content, but they're trying to come up with ideas for how to find places to link. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, do you have anything for that to add? Yeah. Yeah, I really like that, uh, the word association thing. That's interesting. (laughs) Um, uh, So the way that I come up with with topics um, is I usually start with with competitor research, especially if I'm working on with a client um, back in my, when I was at the agency, and I wasn't super familiar with the space. Um, I would start with content competitors and see what's driving a lot of traffic, what keywords are driving a lot of traffic for them. Mm-hmm. And particularly uh, keywords where they, so like for instance, um, HubSpot has a big sales blog. They ranked for um, follow-up emails, which obviously our tool is, is relevant to that keyword. Um, mm-hmm. But what they ranked on the second page for was follow up email after no response, which is a, you know you would have thought that there would be more like more direct overlap in that in that keyword, but they were on the second page for that, and there was actually a ton of volume for that. So uh, and and it wasn't as competitive as as follow up emails. So we wrote an article about follow up email after no response that drives a huge amount of traffic uh, to the Mailshake blog, and that was all based off of keying off of what other content competitors. Um, kind of have already done the hard work of of seeing what um, seeing what actually drives uh, drives a traffic volume, and um, so I usually start with that, and then to kind of bring back to my my previous point about about top spin. Um, I don't know if that's the best phrasing for it, but that's that's what I found has been useful for me. It's um, taking the keywords, starting with the, a list of keywords, and then thinking about what can I, how can we write this in a way that makes it interesting or unique or a little different. So it's not just longer, like, oh, the top one, or the top article for this is 2,000 words. Let's make ours 4,000 words. It'll be better. It's like, how can we change it up just a little bit um, to make it interesting and different? Um, so that's that's where I spend a lot of time when it comes to ideation is is finding that, uh, finding that top spin. OK. We have, looks like we have about five, six minutes left, so. I was going to try to get a few more of the submitted questions from the chat. One is, how do you keep track of all of your clients' content for when the opportunity comes up for a link? So I guess that means maybe you had something that you did six months ago. Do you 
think about that and like you might see an opportunity and you think, oh, well, here's an opportunity to get a link to something we did a while back. Do you guys yeah. do that? And, and I mean, how do you organize that if you have a lot of content? Yeah, sure. I guess obviously it's getting to understand your client's website inside out. So doing a lot of research in the beforehand. But um, for me, I have a lot of like alerts set up. So whether that's Google alerts or similar um, so that I know, OK, if um, this topic is mentioned, then it will come into my inbox and then I can react fast. Um, but from, from my perspective, um, I guess um, it's just being aware and just knowing um, what sort of content that we can react to anyway and even if it's not content that's already on the website and um, that we can create um quite quick or fast to be able to get into the press um but yeah it's just kind of like monitoring live um and making sure that um we um use like tools like google and um, trends and stuff um to spot opportunities in that way okay mark um so you know, I've been managing the content at Mailshake long enough where uh, hmm. any, anything that we're trying to, to build links to is one that I was a part of coming up with. So it's, it's easier for me when I'm not, I'm only managing one client, which is the company I work for. So it's, it's not <laughs> quite the same, I think, for, for managing that. It's, it's a lot. We had a question in the chat. Um, we had talked a little bit earlier about emails um, versus the phone. And my friend David had asked a question, which is the fastest, which is the best way to land a link, the email or the phone? Now, I know, Mark, you said you will get on the phone. And I shuddered. And I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't handle it. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, how, Carrie, do you ever get on the phone to get a, to get a link? Um, no, not really. I used to. I guess um, at a previous agency, they tried to push it as much as possible. Um, they saw it in a traditional PR perspective of go and build relationships, pick up the phone. But I think nowadays journalists, just, or especially writers and editors, don't have the time to kind of listen to me on the phone. They would much rather like me drop them an email um, or send them a tweet. Um, so yeah, I definitely use alternative ways like that. I've done it before where I've called, say, a journalist and they've literally said to me, I'm really sorry, I'm busy, can you just drop that in an email? Um, so I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Um, so I, yeah, I, I always resort to um, emails or, or Twitter to pitch to um, editors. Right. Yeah, and just to clarify, I would never cold call to get a link. Right. Uh, <laughs> this is usually I've already gotten the link. If I'm getting oh, okay. on, a, on a call with someone, um, it's we, we have a relationship. We've exchanged a handful of emails, and I, there's like an opportunity for both of us to help each other out. Whether that's more link building or or um, you know product partner like uh, integrations or something like that, I would never cold call to get a link. I think, especially marketers, um, so we run a lot of content for sales, so I'm kind of in that space mm -hmm. a lot, but um, marketers, I think, uh, would, would not want to receive a call. I think it'd be hard to even find their phone number. Uh, <laughs> I would imagine journalists at least get that sometimes. I couldn't imagine somebody calling me and being like, hey, like, I loved your article on this. Would you mind, like, adding? <laughs> like I would never do that. Yeah, so the, the, the phone, yeah. getting on the, <laughs> yeah, getting on the phone is to, like, is to, to build the relationship, it's not to yeah yeah to land right. a link. Okay, and somebody asked, would you rather have? And we're talking about DA here, uh, one DA seventy link or two DR forty links. Now, my, I I am big on relevance and not really the numbers, but I'm curious what you guys would think about that. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, that the thing about the the DR stuff is it's like. You know, I, I'm not exactly sure what to, to kind of make of it sometimes because it's it's just like it's a guess that get Maz or Samrush or Ahrefs are are coming up with about the 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 value of the the public the blog. I think relevance is. I would probably rather have two 40 DA links that are more relevant than the 170 DA link. But it also depends. I think it depends on a lot of things. If if uh, um, if there's an opportunity for something beyond just that one link from the higher value, higher DA site, uh, I guess I might rather take that. I don't really think about it in terms of a trade-off between would I rather get a 70 or 240. Um, I think that that there's, there's a lot to that that it's, it's, it's hard for me to even have an opinion on which I prefer. Yeah, I think it goes back to the whole quality quantity debate. So like, yeah. would I rather get like 10 to 20 links or would I rather get like, you know, a couple which are like high quality? Or for me, like I would always go for the high quality, even if it's just the one. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, it goes down to um, those 
to kind of like that debate that a lot of people, I have that still to this day. So like still clients this day would rather have a hundred links on really small blogs or sites. Um, yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's not on my approach. I'd rather much go for the quality stuff, even if it's two, three. But um, it also kind of touches on diversity. So diversifying your backlink profile. So I would obviously go to um, top tier press, but then next time round, I would think about how I can create content or ideas that then would get onto a different website. Um, so that I'm not always going to the same websites that we're thinking about how to um, get in front of new audiences. Right. And uh, Andy Simpson just said in the chat, depends on where your audience is as well. So yeah. I think that's very true. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I guess we will have to end with that because it is one o'clock. We've been here an hour, which always amazes me when we come to the end. <laughs> I know. A lot we didn't cover. So um, I'm sure you guys would be happy to answer any questions on Twitter. If anybody yeah. reaches out, I certainly would as well. And um, I appreciate everybody joining us. It's really nice that everybody, you know, participates in the chat mm -hmm. and helps us socialize this. So it's been a lot of fun. And this will definitely be one that I will have to watch again when I'm not so focused on the next question. <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of great answers in here. So I really appreciate you guys. Appreciate everybody yeah. joining. And Thanks we will for see having you me. Oh yeah, thank you. We'll see thank you, you. in another month. Bye. Bye. Bye.